Hi, I'm Hillary Knight, pro hockey player in the PWHPA and Olympic gold medalist, and I'm on The Game Plan. Professional hockey player Hillary Knight, thanks for joining us on The Game Plan. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Hillary, help us understand a little bit your journey to becoming a professional hockey player. Yeah, um, I mean, I I think it was sort of by accident, to be honest. Um, I grew up I grew up in a predominantly ski family. I was on skis at two, even before skates. And I know usually hockey players get on skates around two, but um, grew up in California. My mom moved us to, or I guess our whole family moved to Illinois. And my mom's super athletic, so. She just saw sport as a vehicle for us to meet other kids in the community, and that's how I got introduced to hockey, and honestly, once I laced up my skates, it was like, let's do this. Um, So I always thought I was going to play in the NHL growing up, Um, didn't know women's hockey really existed until 98, which was the first birth um, of women's hockey in the Olympics. So um, by chance and by accident, I'd say I became a pro hockey player, but um, now we're trying to fulfill that dream and make sure it's a reality for generations coming up. Yeah. And let's talk a little bit more about that transition from college where you won a national championship at the university of Wisconsin into then becoming a professional hockey player. What was that like for you? Um, it was really difficult to be honest, because I think, um, you know, when you're in college, you take for granted all these resources (laughs) and, uh, being one of the the big sports on campus. I mean, we're, we're treated so well at the university of Wisconsin, um, and then just assuming that the treatment would be similar, if not more. Um, and then essentially packing up my family car and moving out to Boston and be like, okay, like, how do I make ends meet now um, to be able to fulfill this dream, to train, obviously for another Olympic Games. But um, it's crazy when I look back to think that I was living off of like Dunkin' Donuts, like at the end of the day, or peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Um because I went from, you know, winning two national championships. I had a silver Olympic silver medal at the time, and now I'm just trying to make ends meet. So you have to get creative, but I think that's where sort of the other hat of having an entrepreneurial spirit comes into play. And I think back now because we're in way better position than we were before, but we're still without a pro league. Yeah, that was one of the things that um, we had chatted with Angela Ruggiero about, who uh, you guys uh, shared a prep school, uh, you know, growing up. And so, uh, you know, she was telling us that, Sometimes she tries not to reflect on the idea that her male counterparts, you know, being a, a top defenseman, uh, the disparity it's tough. In, in how they're doing it, it's hard not to realize that, hey, you're at the top of your game, but it's just not being seen in that way. You know, h- help us understand a little bit about your mindset and mentality, realizing that and, and then still sort of saying professional is the route for me as opposed to maybe going and doing something else after playing in college. Yeah, no, it's interesting. I think um, a little bit of stubbornness <laughs> comes into play. It's in my blood and fabric, and I think all of ours. But yeah, I mean, I mean, if you look sort of at like my male counterparts, you know, I'd be banking like eight to ten million annually, right? Somewhere around that. Um, but you know, that's just that's just not the case. That's not where the sport is right now for us, and it's unfortunate. But um, I try not to think about it because it does get frustrating. <laughs> but no, I think. Um, you know, we're, we're in, uh, we're in good standing to create something and to build something. But, um, you know, I think we're still waiting for bigger investment in the sport and whatnot. Um, but I'm sorry, I forgot the other piece of your question. No, no, no. I I think that's a, that's a sort of great jumping off point because, um, one of the challenges I think that, that leagues, uh, especially on the women's side have had, and, and, you know, we've chatted with Megan Klingenberg talking about it on the soccer side. And obviously we've heard it from Angela. Um, is is the the fan engagement and i think sometimes you know everything flows from that whether it's media whether it's merchandising you know what are some of the the things that you feel like uh you and your teammates and and you know other folks in the league have done uh to really draw the sort of fan engagement side to the women's sport well i mean look we had we had two essentially dueling leagues right um one of them folded the other one just isn't where it should be in my personal opinion um and, you know, the best players in the world got together. I think there's like 200 and something of us, maybe less this year, um, and said, you know, how do we fill this void? And that's where we came up with the PWHPA, um, and that's where we established the Dream Gap Tour, which is essentially to combat that visibility issue and that consistency issue, right? Because a lot of fans um, were really only in front of them every four years. 
and we have this amazing product and it's just not consistent and it's very difficult to you have to be like a cult follower to be able to find women's hockey right it's it's almost like playing hide and seek uh, or going on an easter egg hunt to figure out which stream so i think part of it is providing consistency of schedule consistency of platform um, which we're trying to do. Obviously, we're a player-driven um, initiative, so it's different than an actual league. However, um, we're hoping that, you know, in the meantime, between now and the next Olympics, which we're only a year out, um, that we, we have hit those points of visibility so young girls aren't losing the dream until we do get this professional league, um, you know, in place. But it's interesting. We were talking about this a couple weeks ago, and it's, it's so simple, but it's just consistency, Right. If you have a product and you're like, this is where you go to get this product, people are going to know where to find women's hockey. Um, and it's just, it's wonderful to see how the sports evolve, but we're still missing that visibility and accessibility piece. Yeah. And obviously throwing in a global pandemic is certainly not yeah. helpful to the situation. <laughs> the situation. Let's talk yeah. a little bit more about the PWHPA, which you've really been the flag bearer for and, and the key organizer on. You know, where did that come from for you beyond just seeing the need for it? Um, honestly, it came out of frustration of not having the right build for a professional level at, at for hockey. Um, you know, I think over the years we've been sort of taken advantage of, so to speak, um, and been provided games and programming, but it just wasn't the right business model to match it. You know, all those shared services you think about that, um, you know, these NHL clubs have, like we need those, right? Um, and it just, it was sort of just, you know, filling one bucket to fill another bucket to try and continue, right? Instead of having a strategic plan of how do we move the sport forward? How do we actually have tangible growth? How do we engage with the fans on a different level? Um, So, yeah, I think the PWHPA was just founded out of frustration and also, you know, a collective group of players just being like, we deserve better. We need better. Not only do we need better, but like, if not us, then it's going to fall in the next generation. And what a travesty to continue to pass along this burden. So um, I think we're really close to getting where we need to be, but it's definitely a collective effort. I mean, these, these players are essentially sacrificing the prime of their careers to go on this dream gap tour, right? Which is awesome because it's providing programming and visibility for the sport. However, I'm sure everybody would love to have a league right now. Um, but it's really just finding the right mold. Yeah, I definitely want to talk more about the Dream Gap Tour, which we'll get into. But you mentioned uh, entrepreneurial mindset at, at one point. You know, take us into the details. Like, was your first step once you had a few other players with you say like, okay, now what? Like, you know, are you calling a lawyer? <laughs> are you creating a presentation? Like, <laughs> oh, you know, yeah. what kind of things are you actually doing to set up the yeah. PA? You know, it's interesting you asked that because, um, you know, we had we had success not too long ago, I think it's 2017, the equitable support battle that we had with our national governing body. Um, and through that process, we met an amazing law firm, Ballard and Spar, who helped us navigate those, those waters. Um, and we were successful. And I think having that um, game plan and being able to say, hey, look, look what we did on this side. Like, why can't we do that on the professional side? Um, and then graciously them signing a board with us again. <laughs> Um, but yeah, they've been instrumental in helping us navigate the professional landscape and figuring out, you know, what's going to work in the future, what works now. Um, and then you put on, you know, take your skates off for a second, you put on sort of all these other hats and you're like, okay, how do I, how do I plan a tour? How do I manage this? How do I do all these things? So we were almost essentially building the plane as we were taking off, so to speak. And now we're in year two and we're extremely successful year one. Um, but it's, it's a lot of work, but we've got the right people in the room to help us navigate it. And, um, you know, it takes a whole, whole team behind the team. Yeah. One of the things that we love to hear, uh, from our guests on the game plan, cause you know, we know a lot of our listeners come from the business world and, and sort of, you know, face their own challenges. They're building their businesses is what surprised you the most uh, among all those things that you've listed in terms of taking your skates off and now putting on the, the, you know, the business mindset, what surprised you the most or what did you learn the most through that process? Oh, man. Um, Honestly, I think everything's been sort of a learning curve. And I think uh, the timeline in which we launched everything, we were playing catch up for the first year, right? And honestly, COVID, like we had an amazing plan for this year. And then we're like, okay, plan B because of COVID, plan C, plan D, plan E. And just like every other company out there, um, 
you know, we've had to adjust and adapt. And our players have been patient. Um, the people that work with us have been patient. But in addition to that patience, we've also secured major um, partnerships and sponsorships for the PWHPA, which is going to be huge moving forward. So um, I think that's the silver lining of everything. Everything's shut down. Our plans have just, you know, gone all over the place. We're now getting back into place. We're going to be playing at MSG um, end of February. So there's there's a lot of exciting things that are coming down the pipeline, but all of it hinges sort of on a global pandemic. Jay, it sounds a lot like uh, our founder stories that, that we talk to, right? Just having I know, to deal it, with it, everything when you add COVID is. to the mix is not not helpful. It, it yep. is, it's this interesting thing where, uh, you know, when we when we hear from founders where uh, the first time they're like, yeah, I didn't know what to expect. And then you just go into like solution mode. You're like, OK, great. Like everybody's facing it. And 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 here we are as we're going through it. Were there other um, leagues or models that you looked at when you were putting together this this plan for the PWHPA? And, and you know, what did you sort of take from them uh, for you? Yeah, no, it's super interesting. So um by no way we're we're gonna we're a league, we're an association, a collection of players. So I think that's the big differentiator for us is that we've got the best players in the world, or I, sh- I should say in North America, because there's amazing players over in Europe right now. But um we're we're providing different membership services for all of our players for programming and resources, um, you know, for training and, and things like that and medical. Um but in terms of a league, you know, it's crazy how much, how many times people just come on us and we're like, oh, you know, we'll give you a million dollars to start this league. We're just like, no, hold up. <laughs> like, we don't just need a million dollars. You know what I mean? And so we've had a lot of uh, generous people come forward and say, hey, we want to be a part of this or we want to throw money at this. And it really takes the right type of people in the room to get this where it needs to be. And I think that's sort of the cautionary tale of you, know, you can't just take money from anywhere, right? It has to align with the mission. It has to align with what the players believe in. Um, it also has to align with what we see as the vision of the, sp- the future of the sport. Um, so it's, I think before we were like, you know, there's not enough money in women's hockey and now there's just, there's a lot of money and people just want to get into it wholeheartedly, but we really have to do our due diligence and make sure it's the right path. And, um, you know, our greatest asset is our players and, um, we're, we're willing to protect that. Wow. So is that patience born out of maybe previous failures with some of the leagues? Absolutely. Or, yeah, where is that yeah. coming from? Cause that, you know, it, not many people say no to money, right? Like, yeah, that's not a easy. It's thing hard, to do. right? Too. Um, no, I think it's um, it's one of those things where we've had leagues before and they haven't worked. We've seen you know other models work and haven't worked. Um, the f- the truth is, you know, any women's pro league um, that's successful now has had uh, you know been under the auspices of their their the male leagues, right? Um, whether we like it or not, that's that's the history, right, of sports. So um, I think, as I spoke before about, like, shared resources, I think there's a – people don't appreciate all the work on the back end, behind the scenes, that um, allow these players to comp- compete on the NHL stage, right? So there's all these other facets of specifically sport um, that go into it. Yeah, and we have seen other leagues now that have kind of – Rosen up in the past few years. I'm thinking of like the professional lacrosse league and what Paul Rabel's done with Rabel's done with his large social following. You have a pretty large social following yourself. T- tell us about the cultivation of that and what that aspect's been like for you. For you, yeah, no, Paul. I mean, Paul's brilliant, right? I think uh, you know we've talked a handful of times. And he's like, why don't you guys do this? And I'm like, I know, I know, <laughs> patience, patience. But um, no, to see. Um, um, you know, the lacrosse just absolutely take off is really promising, uh, especially the non-traditional approach that he's providing, which is great. So our tour somewhat takes it a little bit after that in, in some ways. But um, in terms of social following, it's, you know, it's another platform. It's it's almost free marketing, right? So um, you talked about Ange earlier, and uh, we were sitting on a bus, um, I think it was before my first Olympics, and she's like, oh, you should really get this Twitter thing. And I was just like, what? There's Facebook. Like, I don't need Twitter. She's like, no. Like, come on, just do it. So I did it. And, um, you know, it's interesting because you look now and, like, Twitter was the big thing, right? And then Instagram, and now TikTok, and it, it just sort of evolves. But you understand um, over the course of years how important social media is, not only to get your message out there, but provide visibility to the sport, and then also engage with these fans, 
Because if you think about our disconnect on the women's side, we don't necessarily have a consistent platform. So how are fans tuning in and getting to know our storylines? And yeah, there's mainstream media, but um, social media is a, a perfect platform to do that. It's a really interesting shift that we've seen, I think, over the last decade, which is now, you know, we, Tim and I talk about this on the show a lot, which is we were in this era of endorsement for sports and, and everybody was, you know, a Gatorade athlete or they were a, or a Red Bull athlete. And yeah. now it's coming into this, this era of authenticity where people don't so much care about the brand, but they care about the person. And, and, and now it's about that one-to-one -one connection that, that you're able to build. So I guess on that lens, tell us about uh, the, the Dream Tour and, and how you're able to build that connection with fans and what that tour looks like. Well, that's where I think we have a competitive advantage, right? Uh, women's sports in general, specifically women's uh, ice hockey players, because we have that natural alignment with our fan base. Um, and that's what companies are looking for. That's what brands are looking for, right? And um, in addition from not only from the business side, but from the consumer standpoint, um, you know, we see women with purchasing power, right? And now we're feeling more compelled to align and purchase products that align with our personal, you know, mission and goals. So when we talk about engagement with fans and that, that organic uh, combination. I mean, it's, it's lethal for us, right? So um, I see that as a huge competitive advantage for female athletes moving forward, especially with the plug-in of social media, right? But um, we're also able to use social and use various players' platforms to collectively push the PWHPA and connect with fans and continue to provide content that, um, you know, helps players out, but also helps the mission of what collectively we're all trying to accomplish. Tell us a little bit more about that content side of it. I think that's such a, such a powerful thing. And we're seeing other leagues that are now starting to capitalize that, whether it's, you know, the NBPA and what they're doing with their players or, or the NFLPA. Talk to us about the content side of it and, and how you think that your association can really leverage that. Yeah, well, I, I think we saw a big shift with social impact, right? And, um, you know, you look at the WNBA uh, Players Association and all the players that are playing in that league and how outstanding of a job they did, um, you know. And then obviously other leagues and, <laughs> and people are falling in suit, uh, which is phenomenal. But I just I think it goes to show and demonstrate the power of voice and, um, you know, whether someone has thousands, hundreds of thousands of followers or not, um, you know, those women are marketing themselves and continuing to help drive change and, and impact in their communities. Um, and then collectively, you know, from the top down, it, it, it uh, puts them on the map and it also helps facilitate that change officially. I'd like to go and shine a light uh, in a little bit different direction, just more on your own personal journey and the ups and downs of in 2018, winning a gold medal, appearing on SNL with a speaking role where you have an incredible one-liner, which I won't, I won't say on the show, but all of our, all of our listeners should go check out what you said to Colin Jost. And, um, but then, you know, the, maybe the, as they say, the confetti, you know, falls and it stops and you're kind of back into it and you're faced with like the challenges of no league and, and all these things like take us into that up and down experience a little bit. Yeah, um, I'd be lying if I said um, I didn't think it would be this hard after winning a gold. I think a lot of us sort of hang our hats and think, okay, once we win a gold medal, because we haven't done it in 20 years, um, you know, the sport's going to change in the U.S. specifically. Um, and then, you know, we had a, a league fold and now we're in this position, right? So um, it's really interesting, but... At the same time, there there are different sort of um, you know parallels between sport and the you know establishing the PWHPA from the business standpoint, right? But um, you know, I, it it's crazy to think of sort of the ups and downs, as you said, right? Because you just assume that things are going to get snapped into place and you're going to continue to go up. Um, but it it's a lot of work to continue that momentum. Um, and you know, I I think it's silly. Uh, when I look back and think, you know, oh, gold medal is going to change this much or X amount, right? Um, because sport's not that way. You win and then you're right back to where you started. So, um, you know, it's it's very humbling. And also, I think it keeps us hungry. I mean, we're out to, we sort of have this insatiable appetite to, to expect, demand more and also change. And let's look forward a little bit. So you've got the Olympics coming up again next year. But then even beyond that, like, what is the next five to 10 years look like for you, especially as you're 
you're not just preaching but acting this patient route yeah. you know how do things, yeah, develop? things develop well um i hope i'm hoping we get ourselves to a position where we do have a sustainable um league to play in i mean that would sort of be the dream come true um in the meantime training is a hopeful for hopefully another gold medal right fingers crossed <laughs> But um, no, I, I want to see the sport just catapult to a new level. It's time. Um, the sport as a pro- product where it is, is ready. Um, you know, I think uh, it's, it's, it's coming and it's coming quickly. So we just have to be ready to embrace it and, and ready for the speed at which it, it hits us with. So um, no, all, all exciting things. But I think if anything, um, this group of women, if uh, we look back, I mean, establishing a pro league would be one of the biggest things that we've done. Yeah. And, and Tim has asked you to look forward. So I'll ask you to look backward and reflect a little bit. We love to ask our guests, knowing what you know now, what is some advice that you would have given your younger self? Oh my gosh. Um, that's hard. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we I don't know. Yeah. Maybe we, Jay, maybe we should make Jay, maybe we should make Jay answer the question, answer question first. And <laughs> <laughs> People don't care about no, what Jane I think, I think on that. So much, so. Yeah, it's just, you know, staying um, resilient. I, I think you have these, you know, seeds of doubt that creep in because things aren't necessarily falling in the order or as fast as they need to fall into uh, place. But uh, Billie Jean King told us, she's like, things don't happen as fast as you want them to. You need to be patient through the process. And, um, you know, that's really great advice because as long as you know where you're going, you have a plan on how you're going to get there. It might not always look how you drew it out on paper, but, um, if you're stubborn enough, you can go out there and do it. And I think that's like the biggest thing is, you know, when I was picking up pennies in the stop and shop parking lot to make ends meet, you know, right after graduating college to now, um, you know, things have changed, but, uh, we're still missing that one piece, but we're going to get there. So it's just going to look a little bit different. Yeah, it's, it's amazing how often the idea of that process orientation versus that goal orientation comes up with our guests. And, and I think it's, it's something that a lot of our listeners, maybe in the business world, don't appreciate as much because it's like, OK, I'm going to get that next promotion or I'm going to close that deal. But I, I think you said it beautifully, which is, OK, you get the win and then you still have to wake up the next day and, and go back to work. Right. And so I think that the idea of applying that that mindset of, OK, it's, it's about the journey, not the destination. I think it's such a such a powerful uh, place to be and, and a really great place for us to close today. So, Hillary, thank you so much for joining us today. We wish you and the PA the best of luck and are excited to see you guys play at MSG uh, later this month. So we'll be looking out for that. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Hillary.